This is Intel's i5-7600K. It's a 4-core, four 4-thread, four 3.8GHz base, 4.2GHz boost clock CPU with a Kaby-like architecture using 6MB of L3 cache and 16 PCIe lanes. It's 300MHz faster on both base and boost from the last generation Skylake 6600K, but it features pretty much the same overall architecture with slight improvements for video decoding and uses the same uh, you know, 1151 socket LGA platform. This means that the CPU still has 1000 151 pins on the back and with a BIOS update will fit in Z170 motherboards as well as the new Z270 ones. Otherwise there isn't too much of a massive improvement or upgrade, there are a few notable upgrades in the Z270 platform for the motherboard such as more USB Type-C, uh, more USB 3.1, USB 3.1 Gen 2 front panel headers as well and of course a few aesthetic upgrades including plenty of RGB LEDs which seems to be the kind of uh, common denominator here. As I mentioned the USB 3.1 front panel header is also a nice addition. As you'd expect in synthetic benchmarks, the non-hyperthreaded i5-7600K is a little bit slower than the uh, both hyperthreaded 6700 and 7700K chips, especially when you uh, take into account overclocking. Now I'm actually considerably impressed with the overclocking potential of this. I OC'd it to 4.9 GHz at 1.45 volts, and I was, as I said, very impressed with the difference that I got from that chip. If you do pick up one of these chips, it seems very 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 easy to get at least a few hundred megahertz extra out of it so I really do recommend uh, just pushing up that frequency just a little bit and getting what is essentially your free performance. In real world testing and stuff like gaming applications and uh, for example the ones that I use GTA 5 and Dirt Rally there really isn't a massive difference. As you can see you're on the order of two or three FPS difference between the 6700k and the 7600k and when you overclock it you get a tiny bit better result as well so there really isn't a massive improvement at this point in time for games. It does uh, will likely depend, you know, what API you're using. So if it's DirectX 12, you might see a bit of a better performance improvement from having hyper-threading and a faster CPU. But at this point in time with the majority of games, I really would recommend the i5 or the, over the i7 if you're just gaming. Especially clock for clock, I really doubt you'll see massive differences between the, uh, you know, 6600K and the 7600K. That's very similar for the i7 versions of these. And even if you go back a generation to the 4670K, that's likely going to be a very similar chip as well if you went clock for clock for it. If you have any of those sorts of chips, I really still don't recommend you know going for them. Uh, in terms of performance, there really isn't a massive difference between the i5 and the i7 in real world scenarios. Uh, of course, uh, if you're just looking at sort of GTA and Dirt Rally, which are the two tests that I've done consistently across all of the chips that I've tested, uh, you're looking at a couple of FPS if you're lucky and potentially that's just an area for a margin of error so I'm not entirely convinced that the CPU has a massive role to play at this point in time. Of course as DirectX 12 and Vulkan become more common and they're able to use more CPU cores uh, and just utilize the CPU better you might start to see a bit of a difference but as I said that currently there isn't a massive difference. Something else I want to touch on is the temperatures. Now for the 6600K you were easily seeing it at 50-60 degrees celsius under stock conditions uh, and I've you know, seen plenty of people overclocking it to 4.5 gigahertz type thing and running it around about sort of 70, 80 degrees. This is something that uh, I can't say for the 7600K. This one, like the 7700K, is just uh, rather hot. I was seeing this running at about 70 degrees with the dual uh, 120 or the 240 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler I'm using uh, and I've used consistently over the, the la you know, all of the other tests. And this one was running at about 70 degrees. Uh, when I overclocked clocked it to I believe 4.9 gigahertz at 1.45 volts I was seeing it at uh, 95 degrees celsius uh, in terms of temperatures this is still as I said quite hot it's also hotter than the last generation and especially considering clock for clock you probably won't see much of a performance difference this is a very interesting thing now as I said these do overclock very nicely that's probably the biggest advantage over you know these chips all of them just seem to overclock brilliantly of course do bear in mind that these uh, all the chips that I'm testing with our review sample chips either sent to uh, me via Intel or sent to me via the motherboard manufacturers who will also have had 
have them binned so that they're exactly you know great overclocking chips so again this is uh, potentially biased data so do bear in mind that and do feel free to check out user overclocks as well but uh, yeah, otherwise it's a pretty interesting chip. So I think if I were to sort of pro and con this, the main things are that it's still a pretty great chip. It's still a, a really nice buy, especially if you're planning on just gaming, but you want a bit of overclocking headroom, you want to be able to overclock it nice and easily, and you want a Z270 motherboard. That is, uh, you know, it's a perfectly good chip for that. Uh, I think the main things for me, that the main differences uh, are that I would personally go for a 6600K right now. They're still 10 to 20 pounds cheaper at this point in time uh, while well, stocks last as such uh, and you can still use a Z270 motherboard with a 6600K if you really want to if you want you know slightly better USB type C and 3.1 support and that sort of thing but uh, as I said it's still a, a very nice chip to buy if you can't get a 6600K for cheaper and of course if you don't mind the slightly hotter temperatures the slightly higher power draw and all that sort of stuff then this is still a pretty nice chip of course if you also want to watch your 4K Netflix this one is a necessity you can't use your 6 600k for that but um yeah i suppose that's just uh what you get with newer stuff and uh, all that uh, lovely drm um otherwise in terms of scoring i'm gonna go with a four for five money i'm gonna go with a five per performance because it's a great chip unfortunately it's just not that great over the existing chip but uh I guess that's what you get with little competition. So uh, yeah, uh, in terms of functionality, I'm gonna go with, I think a five, it's actually no 4.5 because of the temperatures. Uh, in terms of uh, styling, it's a chip, so it's a five. And touching BB score, I'm gonna go with a four. It still gets the gold award because it is still a great CPU. It's still a great option for gamers and all that sort of thing, but it's just disappointing that there's so, so little improvement over the last generation uh, and all that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of that really. If you want to pick up one of these chips, I've left a link to Overclockers UK and Worldwide Amazon links in the description down below for you to check out. And if you want to buy anything else and support me further, feel free to use the more generic links down there too. Other than that, feel free to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. If you found it useful, feel free to let me know in the comments down below. And if there's anything you have any questions on or anything else uh, or any thoughts you have on these chips, especially the difference between the generations, let me know in the comments down below too. Uh, and other than that, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of that really. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to check out the uh, Z270 motherboards and the i7 review as well. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on the next video.